Hi, I'm Julian Walker and I'm a psychologist by background, but I'm also research director for the Mental Health Trust that covers Bristol, Avon and Wiltshire. And as part of the exec for Bristol Health Partners, I've been very fortunate to conduct a series of interviews with people who are working in the field of health in Bristol, and in particular who are working with the health integration teams, which are the important driving force uh, behind innovation and improvement in health in Bristol Health Partners. Today, I'm excited to be talking to Primrose Granville, who some of you may know as a broadcaster journalist for the BBC and for BCFM and you may have caught her show on Thursdays. But she's also chair of the Malcolm X Centre in St Paul's, and she's a public contributor to the kidney disease health integration team in Bristol Health Partners. She describes herself as the accidental cam campaigner for health issues, but particularly organ transplant in African Caribbean communities. So thank you, Primrose. Um, and my first question is, how did you end up doing what you're doing? <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction, Julian. How did I end up doing what I'm doing? I think I don't know how to be quiet about things. So all the things you've just listed are largely related to my health. And um, growing up, I knew there was a lot of kidney disease in my family, but I grew up in a traditional Jamaican family as a child it's none of your business to ask about anything to do with health and I resented that from as from as probably as early as six years old I probably resented it and then I grew up thinking my son needs to know if there's anything wrong with me I didn't know what was wrong with my mother because I have hereditary polycystic kidney disease which came from my mother uh, my mother has it my sister has it um, my son has it and I've had it my mother, my sister and I have had transplants. I didn't want my son to be questioning things and finding out his mother's kidney disease when he's diagnosed because that's what happened to me. And I'm just, I'm just very curious about educating my community. I'm, edu I'm, I'm curious about educating people. I'm an early years teacher by training. I believe in education, especially our young people and our children, because if we educate them, then they'll know what to do later on in life. So I don't know a number of reasons why I'm involved in what I'm doing, just getting the message across and, and caring for people to, you know, to make sure if you know what's wrong with you, you can, you can fix it. You know, I like G.I. Joe and he says knowing is half the battle won. And so how did you, um, from that, how did you end up getting involved with the uh, kidney, kidney disease health integration team? Um, I think I did a piece of research for them. And then I, I think I might have asked some questions that, that, that led to my being asked if I'd like to be involved. And I said yes. And um, I wanted to be involved because very few people get involved in research. Very few people get involved in in asking the right questions or being in the right places to ensure that change can be made so that future care is much better and, and easier delivered. So that, I mean, that sort of relates to what you, what we discussed before, which was something about your message to the people of Bristol or the thing that you're trying to change is about talking about health, isn't it? It's about openness, about health and well-being. Well, members of the African Caribbean community are famous for not talking about health. As a youngster, um, you'd hear things like, Mrs. Brown dropped down and dead. You'd never know what killed Mrs. Brown and you couldn't ask. And if I had known, say, what killed my uncle or my grandmother, I would know what might lay ahead for me and I might be able to make the preparations for it. My son found out at nine years old that he had polycystic kidney disease. I found out at 27. My mother probably found out in her late 30s. But we don't talk about these things. We have to talk about them. There's a shame element to illness, almost as if you called it on yourself. And we, we need to get away from that. And this is for every single community. It's not just people 
or of African Caribbean heritage that don't talk about illnesses, other communities do as well. And they hide things and you can't ask grandma, why do you take those pills grandma? Because she'll go, oh nothing. But you want to know as a child. There's a, sort of, there's a bit of a generational thing, isn't it? We were talking about our parents and our grandparents' generation. But um, maybe also a gender thing. I think men as well perhaps sometimes can find it more difficult to talk about things or to be vulnerable in that way. If we could just get the men to talk more. They're talking. They talk among themselves as well, you know. But they're not talking generally. And I think that is changing, that is trending up but it's very slow. Mm. And the women need to encourage the men to talk. There is this underlying message that when men talk about things that bother them, they're weak. Actually, that's a lot of strength. It takes a lot of strength to talk about something that could make you vulnerable. It took an awful lot of strength for me to openly admit that I had kidney, well, renal failure. When I found out, I didn't tell my mother for three months. I didn't tell anyone for six months till the day. And when I, when I made it public, people were like, you're, you've got kidney disease, but you're so cheerful and you're so happy and you're so, and I'm like, yes, I do, I do. And people were in shock because this messenger didn't talk about it. But I would talk about my mother. I talk about my sister. I talk about anybody else. I didn't talk about me. I didn't talk about me for years. And then when the final diagnosis came, I didn't talk about it for six months. And you, and you described that as your sort of um, becoming the accidental campaigner. Um, and although we're, ta we're talking partly about um, organ transplant, you're talking about the whole of health. And it reminds me that one of the things we wanted to talk about was COVID-19 and the sort of um, impact of COVID-19 perhaps on people's perspectives and how people see things and talk about things. So I wondered if you sort of noticed um, any of those changes or how you had felt in response to what, what you'd seen and heard. Well, COVID-19 had two sides for me because I had the misfortune of being in hospital twice, not for COVID-19, but I had to be there and my fright at hearing a paramedic say to me, um, you've really got to go in Primrose because you're very ill. And I'm like, no, but I want to stay home. And it's when, when, when he says to you, you can see in his eyes, he's saying to you, I can't force you, but I really need you to. The fright of having to go into hospital during COVID-19, all those images from the news flash in front of you immediately and you think, you think you're going onto a COVID ward. That's what I think, I thought. I thought, I'm gonna go into this hospital. It's a great big COVID hospital and I'm going to go on a COVID ward and I'm going to get COVID. So that fright, and suddenly I became somebody who was in hospital with COVID-19 and how frightened they must be, how frightened their family members must be, how frightened people are about COVID-19, how frightening it is in the African Caribbean community, where death after death after death, especially with NHS workers, were people from the African Caribbean community. And I thought, am I gonna die when I go in there? And I, I, I kid you not, for those first six days that I went in, it was torture. It was absolute torture. And I started thinking about my community Every day must be torture for them if they have to go to work. I was in my house, I was shielding. I'd left my house for two months at that, at, at that stage. People, people were scared. COVID-19 ravaged us. Yeah. It ravaged us to the point where we, we didn't really know what to do with ourselves. Our loved ones were dying. If you've never been to an, an African Caribbean funeral, they're huge. They're celebrations of life, they're happy. Most of the times there's sadness, but then there's the happiness with the food and the Jamaican white rum. Got to mention that when there's a death. We didn't have that anymore. We had people who couldn't have more than, is it five at first? And that was trauma for us. So it's trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. And you're thinking to yourself, they still have to survive. They still have to live. Some of them still have to go to work. How are they doing it? 
and it made me it made me think more about people and their absolute survival so there was the trauma side traumatized side of me and then there was a the thoughtful side of me oh i wish i could get out there and do something i couldn't get out there and do anything but i sat i did a lot of writing so i've got a lot of writing about covid-19 that are reflections that i've not shared with people because sometimes nobody thinks i'm vulnerable or weak most people don't see me as vulnerable or weak and it's almost as if you don't want to be vulnerable and weak because that's not who you are you're primrose you campaign and you you chair stuff and you seek money to put on projects to make your community better you're not a vulnerable person you don't have any vulnerabilities you can't either but i did i had many at the beginning like you say people in hospital isolated not being able to go through the grieving process of their loved ones properly i think there's still quite a bit of work to deal with that trauma isn't there before we sort of move on to how can we sort of use the opportunity to improve things i think there's that there needs to be a recognition of what's happened and that the kind of trauma that you're talking about particularly for um african caribbean and other minority communities um who have been worse affected by covid and that that's that a lot of which is to do with um historical injustices which have left people at a disadvantage whether it's to do with health or socio-economic status or opportunities or the kinds of jobs that people do and i wonder if that's that seems to be one of the reflections that people are coming up with and i think it's you know for all of us it's the context in which the black lives matter movement had a resurgence and has made us think of different things that we've all done and that we all need to do and it makes me think about the what we were talking about which is what has any perspective from your point of view changed as a result of all this have you changed your mind or renewed your focus what's what's been the impact of that on your perspectives the impact of this whole situation covid-19 the 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 occurrences in bristol it's made me more determined to fight not even fight to campaign for my community even more i i have found myself as 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 someone on the board of malcolm x i find myself trawling through emails thinking where can we get some funding to do this for our community what can we do for our young people what can we do for young families with children who have to send their children back to school but then there are vulnerable people in the household what are the things that we can do for our elders who are locked away because they don't want to come out what can we do for people like me who definitely don't want to come out and how can i make this all work from my house because i don't want to go out and it's it's just been my perspective is all about let's get this party started and somewhere along the lines we have a Malcolm X is lucky we have a lot of input from the NHS already especially the renal team they're they're amazing with our project but we need to get the leadership of these places of authority the NHS um the police service the fire service the educational services we need to get them out of where they are into our community meet our people and hear from them because our perspective is often not understood and and i you know the the example of going into hospital and if you're not shouting the loudest you tend not to get any attention and my care at southweed hospital I, i couldn't fault it if i tried black women in particular are often overlooked when it comes to pain management when it comes to issues we're overrepresented when it comes to dying after during before after childbirth 
we're overrepresented when it comes to our mental health care because we're not vulnerable, we're strong. Strong people break too, if it's hit hard enough. So I, I agreed before we started to talk and do, and do this conversation that, um, that, that you could ask me a question about anything and um, yeah, what, what, would you, what did you want to ask me? Coming out of COVID, who knows, we might even be going back into it. People are wrapped tight. How are we going to deal with people who are, some people don't know what to do with, with, with stress. So it comes out as anger. And it's, it's, it's so easy to actually label black women as angry and black. How are we going to address that? What can you promise me that you can do? So I did ask you, didn't I? But I, was, I, I said I was going to ask you, what, 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 um, what can I promise to do today so that we feel this conversation has gone somewhere and that we've achieved something? And I think, one of, so one of the things that I can definitely do is I can talk about the things that we've talked about today in the, in the committees and with my colleagues at senior level and both in my trust and in Bristol Health Partners and to make sure that the, um, that the stories that you've described, that I, I talk about you and your story rather than just talking about numbers and data, which I'm probably a bit inclined to do. So the change for me is to really, um, is, is to talk authentically about all the people I've met in these interviews and to talk about the, the points that they've raised and the experiences they've had and try to then do things innovatively at this moment where we have got an opportunity to change. And I do think it's an opportunity to change and almost everybody you talk to has that sense that this feels different. It is, you know, it's objectively different, but it also feels different. So um, the last thing I wanted to ask you about, which I haven't got a perfectly formed question, but it was something about women in leadership. And it's an, it's an important, but sometimes sort of missed topic. And you, you know, I thought you had some interesting things to say on that as well. So, um, moving to the UK for me was culturally shocking, um, not because of colour, but I grew up in Jamaica. Um, I was born, raised and educated there. And Jamaica is only one of three countries in the world, in fact, we top it in terms of statistics, where your CEO, your boss, your manager is likely to be a woman. And I grew up in a society where I was surrounded by these powerful, entrepreneurial, very achieving women never had a male head teacher, never had a male boss, and I arrived here and everything was so male dominated. And I, I thought to myself, but the women are actually leading. They're doing all this, all the stuff, you know. Um, they're, they're just, there's just so much that women do and women actually carry the brunt of leadership and change, but the men actually get the praise because they then put stuff into policy when you're in the background doing all, it's like cooking. You cook and everybody eats and they're satiated. But people often forget who's made the, the meal. And then you wash up. So you do all the hard work. How is that gonna change in, in sort of healthcare fields? Because the women really do the hard work. Yeah, and I think there's, there's some quite good evidence that women make better leaders than men. And um, I'd, I'm, not, I'm not worried about offending all my male colleagues by saying that. Um, and certainly, I've, uh, similarly, I've worked in, in, in a field where, um, yeah, I mean, almost all but a couple of my bosses and managers have been women. So... Yeah, it's not, it's not the same everywhere though, is it? Particularly in health. Um, and that's, that's definitely something that I, I'll be talking to other people about, and which I know is also important to the trusts that are represented in Bristol Health Partners. Yeah, I, I like the sound of that. I, I like the because what we need are allies. And it doesn't matter what our allies look like. As long as there are allies to say, this has to change. 
and I, I like the promise you've made. I'm taking the message and the story to my colleagues because you sit in a place of, of power. It sounds terrible to say, but it's not a bad thing. You sit in a, in a space of power. You can say one sentence in a room that we could take decades to say, and it would change. I, I hope it would. I mean, I think, it, you know, the question for me is how have I used and how can I use the privilege or the power or the advantage um, and, and the seniority of my situation? How, how can I use that to do the right thing? And, it's, and, and part of it is by seeking the kind of guidance that you've been offering today. Break down the doors. Just bang them down until they break. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And it, it, I'm really grateful for you talking to, to me today. You've been open and honest and thoughtful and generous, really, in the way that you've talked about things. So thank you very much, Primrose. You're welcome.